for the first time, good evening. <laughs> Thank you for coming and, and worshiping together. I know just as uh, Holly was saying, I was com I'm completely thrown off today because I'm a creature of habit and I'm not used to this. So I was completely thrown off this whole day. Um, as you were coming in, you should have received a book. Uh, we've got one book for each family or individual. Uh, the title of the book is uh, put an X to it, Putting an X to Anxiety. We, we believe that so many of us were struggling with anxiety, and we wanted to put some truth into your hands. Um, these probably truths are probably things that you guys already know, but they're just good reminders of truth as you go through s uh, seasons of anxiety. So we wanted to put some truth into your hands. Um, but also, you should have received a card coming in as well in a manila envelope. Um, you know, I shared about what our, my Korean church did on, on New Year's Eve where we gave Bible verses. So there's a Bible verse inside. Um, unfortunately, the only version I could find was King James Version. So it's like, kind of like reading Shakespeare. Um, so if you, if you want a business idea, like make cards in the NIV or ESV translation. You might, you might be a million dollar idea. Um, anyway, it's in the King James Version, but you could probably look it up in the NIV and ESV. Once again, this is not a lottery. So if you got a good one this year, you didn't win the lottery, okay? It's not a lottery. Um, it may not even be prophetic. That's up to God to do. If it's up to God, if he wants it to be prophetic this year or not, that's up to God. But really the, the whole heart behind this is that we wanted to put just a, a, a verse into your hands to put on your heart this year that God can use. So, yeah, I just wanted to put something on, in, onto your heart this year that God can use, a word of truth for you this year as you enter 2024. Um, with that, I want us to just begin this time of um, hearing God's word just to give gratitude. Um, I know that it has not been an easy year for everybody, and I know even like right now there are people who are going through things. Um, but I believe that just giving gratitude gratitude to God. It does something for our souls. It does something for our faith. I know that a lot of times when, even when I'm not feeling it, when I'm saying to God, thank you for the things that are, instead of focusing on everything that's not going right or not that I don't have, when I'm saying thank you, God, for what I do have, I know that in my heart, what, I'm, what my heart is saying is, I trust you, God. God, I trust you with my life. And, and faith starts to well up in me. So I would like to take us, I know that some of us, um, even some of us maybe online or at home, we're going through things like right now, like in real time. But I want to just take an opportunity, like ho however bad this year was, you're here today. And those people who are watching online, like you're still here today. You know, that in itself is God's grace to us. Would you take a minute now just to express some gratitude for this past year? Just one thing. One thing that you can thank God that somehow, some way, you, you've gone through some things this year, but somehow, some way, you've made it to today. You're here. Let's, let's thank God together in silence. Lord, we don't always see your hand at work. But we know that your hand is leading us and your grace is holding up our lives and sustaining us. That you are the true sustainer of our lives. So Lord, we want to just say thank you for this year. Even if it's been a bad year, we want to thank you. Somehow, some way, we made it to today. But thank you for that, Lord. God, we are here to hear your word and your truth. We are here to hear a word from you, and we believe you have a word for our church and for each one of us. God, thank you that um, just as we sang, that when we couldn't come to you, Lord, you came to us, and that's what Christmas is all about. That when we couldn't come to you and rise up to you, you came to us. That on the cross, where relationship was broken with you, you came to us to reconcile the relationship. 
So God, thank you that somehow, some way, your presence is here right now. And that you want to meet with us and encounter us and maybe just put a small seed into our hearts that will lead to us seeing your glory and us seeing you again and seeing your hand in our lives that you would be magnified. God, would you, would you be the focus of our worship at this time and lead us into your word? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you like, um, you know, I know there's at least one person here that likes very strange passages in the Bible. Like, this is one of them. And uh, I've, I've chosen this very purposefully because I was looking for passages in the Bible that had to do with like midnight because we were, you know, we were gathering at midnight, right, around midnight. Um, so this is one of the passages that I chose that I wanted to look at. It's a very strange passage, but it's not a passage that like is just random, that has just, it's just a bunch of random circumstances where Jacob finds himself in the middle of the night wrestling with a st- stranger, right? There's a whole backstory to this. And if you know the story of Jacob, um, you know there was an unresolved issue in his life. Jacob had cheated his twin brother Esau out of his birthright, and then he cheated his brother out of receiving the firstborn son's blessing from their father Isaac. And, and this blessing, um, the, Bible doesn't, the Bible doesn't talk about blessings as if they're just words, or you can just take it back. A blessing is a blessing, and it couldn't be reversed. And this made Esau so angry that he was consoling himself with, with the idea of, when my father passes away, I'm going to kill my twin brother. He was consoling himself. And what ends up happening is that um, Jacob, he has to flee, like literally with the clothes on his back. He has to leave and run away. And he leaves his family for years. And he's, he's been estranged from his family for years now. But all of a sudden, like these past, this past unresolved issue with his father, I mean his brother, it comes back to haunt him. Because as God is, le- like, as God is going with Jacob, right, and as the blessing is real in his life, God tells Jacob, hey, it's time for you to go back home. And what that means basically is you got to go back and face your brother. So, as Jacob is making his way back home, he sends a messenger ahead of him telling, to tell Esau, his brother, that he's his servant. And he also, tells, he also sends a message to tell his brother Esau, like, I've become very wealthy in the time that I've been away. So basically, I'm not coming home empty-handed, right? And he's doing this because he wants to find favor in Esau's eyes. In other words, Jacob is kind of asking, like, with these messengers that he's sending ahead, hey, Esau, is it okay for me to come home? And when the servant comes back, the messenger comes back, what he tells Jacob is very unsettling because he said, "Uh, your brother is coming to meet you, but he's actually coming with 400 men, right? Not a good sign. And there is a part of Jacob that does what he has always done. If you know the story of Jacob, what is he? I already gave you a hint. He's a cheater, right? He's trying to calculate. He's trying to plan. He's trying to manipulate his way out of a situation. Jacob sends three waves of lavish gifts of cattle to Esau before he even reaches him. He thinks, he's thinking like, hopefully this will pacify him, right? Hopefully this will make his anger go down and he won't want to get revenge on me and my family. Jacob calculates the order in which he's going to go meet Esau, right? First he'll send the gifts, then he will go, then the male and female servants, and then his wives and children at the back, just in case Esau goes on a rampage and everything goes sideways, right? Yet as much as Jacob is trying to address this ominous situation with human planning and calculation, 
there is another part of him that knows that he is so vulnerable and that God needs to intervene. God needs to be true to his promises, that he would be with him, that he will continue to bless him if he obeyed him at home. And since God abandons and forsakes no one, since God is true to his promises, what this tells us is that any struggle anywhere in life is ultimately a struggle with God. All wrestling on earth that we go through is ultimately wrestling with God. And I, as I just mentioned, we see this, right? We see this leading up to Jacob wrestling with the stranger in the night, right? Because he's, he's praying. Even with all of his attempts to calculate and plan his way out of trouble, he's praying. He's wrestling with God. And if you read his prayer, it's very much the things that we, we say in our darkest moments, right? God, will you continue to be faithful? Will you be true to your word and your promises? Will you help me as I'm fighting for my life? That's the gist of his, his prayer. And we also see how earthly wrestling is wrestling with God even after this passage. There's evidence of that even after this passage because the encounter between Jacob and the stranger in this passage, which turns out to be God, mirrors Jacob's encounter with Esau as well. Somehow, like, somehow Jacob's wrestling with God it parallels the unresolved conflict he has with his brother. And this is all, this is all introduction. And what I want us to kind of think about are two points from this introduction. First, our unresolved issues don't disqualify us from an encounter with God. In fact, it may be what leads us to an encounter with God. I think sometimes what keeps creeping into our minds is that if we have unresolved conflicts, we're not going to be able to, that's going to keep us from God. And we see in this passage that that's completely not true. That unresolved issues is not a barrier for God to meet us. Secondly, what I just mentioned, that what we are struggling with today is not just a human struggle but ultimately all struggle because God never forsakes anyone. God never abandons anyone. God is true to his promises. Ultimately tonight, the things that we're struggling with on earth are a struggle with God. And of course, struggling with God is what this passage is all about. So let's, let's, look at, let's go to our passage and start looking at that. So a man, Jacob, is in the night by himself, once again, these are not random circumstances. There's a whole backstory why he's at night. I just explained that. He's alone. He's vulnerable. And a stranger in the night jumps him, basically, and they begin to wrestle. This person's identity is not revealed right away, and they wrestle all night in what appears to be a draw. The stranger doesn't win, but Jacob doesn't win either, but they both haven't lost and they seem like in this wrestling match that they're so evenly matched, right? And as the dawn and first light of day is breaking, the stranger wants to disengage and leave, but Jacob won't let him go. So the stranger strikes Jacob's hip with a blow that is so powerful that Jacob's hip is put out of, out of the joint. And even after the encounter, he's still limping. That's how powerful this blow was. And it's here, actually, that we get the first indication of who the stranger is, that this stranger is not just a man, but this stranger is a supernatural being. But even with that, Jacob doesn't let go. He continues to hang on, right? He refuses to let him go, and in verse 26, Jacob says um, these very famous words, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And this is true of what we read of Jacob in Genesis. If you read the life of Jacob, you realize this is very true to who he is. Like, he'll do anything for a blessing, right? He'll cheat, he'll lie, right? He'll, he'll con his dad out of a blessing. This is very true to who he is, but we also see something more specific in this scene. We see Jacob in his weakness and being physically compromised, continue to wrestle and fight and struggle for a blessing. 
And this isn't only a picture of Jacob, but I believe this is a picture of the Christian life. That it's, the Christian life is not, um, there is triumph, there is victory in Christ, but often the Christian life is also not one that's lived out of strength, especially human strength, but it's lived out of weakness where we continue to wrestle and struggle and fight until we receive God's blessing. You know, the journey that we go through as Christians is not always clean cut, right? I know we hear a lot of testimonies, uh, and, and I know, that, this, I know that God does this, right? Like one day someone says, one day I was struggling with drugs, the next day I was not an addict anymore. I, I believe God can do that, yeah. But oftentimes, the Christian life is not that clean cut for many of us. Our journey is a mix of weakness, darkness, loneliness, fear, everything that J- Jacob is going through right now. But also, along with that, it's, it's a mix with not giving up, continuing to seek God, continuing to wrestle with God, not letting go until we receive the blessing. This past Christmas, like a family member, we had a family gathering, a family member told me, who works in the food and service industry, he told me, he was sharing with me that there's so much darkness and there's so much brokenness in that, in that industry. And he sees it where he works. And I was actually reminded of someone I know who was working in the food and service industry and he became a full-blown alcoholic. And no matter what he tried, and he went to some extreme lengths to stop being an alcoholic and be free of being an alcoholic, but he just never got free of it. And it's, you know, when I, when I don't have coffee for a day, like I get a day or two, I get like migraines, I get headaches, right? But I can't even imagine what it's like for an alcoholic to try to go sober. I can't, I can't imagine even what it's like for an alcoholic to go through withdrawal because as horrific it is for the alcoholic to repeatedly be drunk, you know what's more horrific? Going through withdrawal. That's why a lot of alcoholics, it's so hard for them to get sober because to get away from the horror of withdrawal, they have to get drunk again. So I understand when I, this, this guy that I know, that it's, he's tried so many things. He's gone to rehab and programs and this and that. Hasn't been free of it. I understand to a degree. Like I can get why... It's so hard. But there's the other side of this that I've seen as well, right? I remember I was at a playground one time near my in-law's house. There's a church. There's like a church, and in the back, there's like a whole park and playground. So when um, my children were younger, my girls were playing at the park. Bishop was still on the stroller. I was just strolling him around so he could sleep. And then in the parking lot, I saw a, a woman, like, in the prime of her life, you know, career, probably in career, and um, a man, I think that was her probably husband or boyfriend, and she was shaking and she was crying. And, then, and the, this man who was probably her husband or boyfriend was trying to console her, holding her and consoling her, and she was shaking and crying. And then they went into the church. I was like, what, what is this meeting? Right? So I went into the, I went to Bishop in the stroll, and I literally just went into the church because I was like, I want to know what this is. Right? And what I saw in there wasn't a pretty sight, I, I should say. It was more people like that woman who were alcoholics. It was Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. People who were alcoholics for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, maybe more. Right? It was more people like that woman I saw in the parking lot fragile, scared, shaking, crying. But these people, they had come, as hard as it is, as horrific as it is, as scary as it is, no matter how many times they fell off the wagon, they were going to hang on until they received the blessing of sobriety. That's what I saw there. Now, I don't believe anyone here is an alcoholic, but... I believe we are all tempted in another direction. 
I believe we are all broken in some other way. We, I believe we've all been struggling in some other way that has been so awful and so traumatic. We wish we could be free of it tomorrow. The Christian life, it includes that messiness and weakness, but also refusing to forfeit the blessing and crying out to God in our messiness and weakness, I will not let you go until you bless me. And what some of us experienced this past year, um, it's, it's along the same lines as the, that Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. Like, I think some of us, when we look at our own lives, and when we look at other people who have struggled, what we see is something that is not pretty. We've gone through things that doesn't look pretty. But we've hung on to God. We are still here tonight saying, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And this kind of life with um, so much that isn't pretty and so much that is messy and so much that isn't resolved, um, a lot of the world will tell you you're lost. You're just lost. Sometimes, sometimes even in church we hear that, that because you can't get your act together, you're lost, right? But, when, but a life where you're, you have that messiness and that weakness and yet you're hanging on to God and saying, I will not let you go until you bless me, that is a life that is actually faith-lived authentically. Think about it. Refusing to let go of God, refusing to forfeit the blessing of God, even when everything in your life is telling you to give up. If that's not faith, I really don't know what is. That is faith lived authentically. Maybe some of us tonight, um, we have been allowing our messiness and our weakness to discourage us. Will you continue to hang on until wrestling becomes blessing? Will you hang on in the night until the day breaks? And that's one of the things that I'm praying that happens in 2024 for some of us, that you keep wrestling and hanging on until the day breaks, until the blessing comes. And I'm praying that that will happen in 2024. Wrestling with God also is not um, where we get beat down by someone who is superior and more powerful. That's what college wrestling is pretty much like, right? The superior wrestler, the stronger wrestler wins, right? And the other wrestler gets beat down and pinned. That's not, that's not what it is, this wrestling match between Jacob and God. That's not what it is like at all. Everywhere in this passage, we see God's grace to Jacob as God wrestles with Jacob and Jacob wrestles with God. If God could cripple Jacob with a touch, right, of his, just a touch, cripple his hip, God could have ended the match at any point he wanted. He doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. He allows Jacob to wrestle with him. Jacob allowed, God allowed Jacob to hang on to him for a blessing. God wanted to get away from Jacob when the day was about to break. And it wasn't because he thought he was going to lose. Because he didn't, he didn't want Jacob to see his holy face in the full light of day and die. Scripture tells us many times, like God says in Scripture many times, no one can see my face and live. Right? Just think about it this way. Like, if God is light, there can be no darkness in light. Right? So everything that has any darkness is gone. Like, you're obliterated. You're annihilated. When God wants to get away from Jacob before the, the day breaks, it's not because it's for the sake of preserving Jacob. And Jacob, of course, you know, Jacob, of course, receives grace to see the face of God just in the shadows of dawn and live. And he even names this place where he wrestled with God as Peniel because he saw the face of God and his life was delivered. And finally, there's grace because he receives the blessing that he asked for. And that's the climax of this passage, where Jacob, um, God asks Jacob what his name is, and then he gives him a new name. 
You've heard me say this. Um, I'm like a broken record by now because you've heard the same, me say this so many times, but names in the Bible are not just names. They're not just personal preference. Names represent a person's nature, a person's identity, a person's future even. Jacob, you probably know this already, but Jacob means cheater, trickster, manipulator, supplanter. When God asks Jacob what his name is, he's painfully acknowledging who he is. But it's this honest and painful admission that brings Jacob to the threshold where God gives him the blessing of a new name, a new nature, a new identity, and a new future. Jacob's new name is Israel, he who contends with God. Jacob's blessing is that who Jacob is and the trajectory of Jacob's life is completely altered. Painful and honest confession before God of who we really are, liar, luster, complainer, warrior, fault fighter, doubter. Honest and painful confession. It doesn't save us, but it does bring us to the threshold of God giving us a new name, a new nature, a new identity, and a new future. And as God wrestles, as Jacob wrestles with God, he receives this incredible grace. And this passage, it's so fitting, I think, for Christmas because it gives us a foretaste of the Christmas message. God who makes himself weak so that we could be blessed. God who will come as a babe in manger. God who will come and die at the hands of men. Why? To bless men. When God came down to us as Jesus Christ, he contends with us, right? He contends with us so he can contend for us so that he can ultimately bless us with a new name, a new nature, a new identity, and a new future. And not only that, the name Israel is significant in the Bible because it's not just Jacob's name. It becomes the name of God's people. And it's a people who are formed um, not by military might or by success or being shrewd in life or even by having their own land after they came out of Egypt, but it's formed out of grace and out of gift to be children of God who contend and wrestle with God. In other words, to be authentic in relationship with God. God wrestles with us, right? God wrestles with us not to beat us down and wear us down. I know that that's sometimes how it feels. He wrestles with us not to beat us down and wear us down, but for blessing, to become who we were meant to be, to be a people in awe of God's goodness to us. You know, God, um, you guys know my testimony most of you do at least um, know my testimony. You know, when, when God met me, I was at a, a place in my life where I was at rock bottom. Like, I know people say I don't have a future, like, figuratively. No, like, I literally, when I look at my life, I had no future. That's where I was. There was no area of my life that was going well. I had, um, not, I had not taken care of my life in a way that honored God. I had destroyed my life. There was nothing, my life was going nowhere. My life was literally going to the gutter. You know, that was the darkness that I was in, and I was by myself. I was alone. My family had been broken apart at that time. My parents were in Atlanta. My sister went to go live with my aunt in, in London, and I was in Toronto. Um, I had lost contact with a lot of my high school friends. Just everything. Like, I was just by myself. No future. In the years that followed, like, and then that's where God met me, right? That's where God met me. In the years that followed, I would face other roadblocks in my life, other, other obstacles that I had to face where it felt like doors were just closing on me. Once again, like no future. And yet, God really showed up for me. And as I wrestled with God through these things, God showed up for me. And he really showed me that he is truly a God who gives a new name, who gives a new future and a new identity, right? My life changed when I met God. And even as I walk with God, there were, it's like a miracle that I'm even married. I don't know, I, I think I, somehow I suckered many into marrying me. We were like talking about this the other day, <laughs> right? 
And then after I married Mindy, it's like everything just kind of worked, like God just kind of worked everything out. When I wrestle with God and walk with God in my life, it was no longer just theoretical. It became real to me who God is. And that when you wrestle with God, it's for blessing. When I left ministry, you guys know the story I've told you many times, that when I left ministry, there's a point at which after I left ministry and I took a sabbatical, I came to a point where I had like enough money in my savings for one more, one more month's rent. And then after, I literally have zero. I have nothing. And no money coming in. And God showed me I could trust, I can trust him with my life. That was one of the hardest times in my life. Not because of just the circum- physical circumstances that I was in, but because I didn't trust God. It was those physical circumstances, plus I don't trust you, God, to take care of me. I have to go find out, I have to go figure this out myself. And God showed me in a very real way as I wrestled with him in that tough time, I can trust God with my life. It's not, this is not theory anymore. Like I've lived this. And I found that on the other side of it that it was all for blessing. He's not, he's not there to, let me, let me teach you a lesson, Ken. Let me teach you a lesson. You don't want to trust me? Let me teach you. It wasn't that at all. It was come back into proper relationship with me. In this room, I believe we've gone through seasons of radical affliction and apparent forsakenness. And I don't know why we've gone through all the things that we've gone through. But until we go through trial, until we wrestle with God, we're only dabbling as a Christian. You know, we were saved from theological mediocrity through wrestling with God, through trial, where Christ's presence and grace become so real to us. Wrestling with God, I know, it's not pleasant. It's not always pleasant. I, trust me, when I was in that time, that dark time where I was, my savings account was whittling down, I, hadn't, I, I didn't see a way for, like, a path forward. I was in a fog. My faith was weak. It was not pleasant. It's not something that I wanted to go through. But on the other side of it was blessing. Blessing came. How about you today? You know, one of the things that I'm praying for that for our church as well and for, your, for each one of you is that this upcoming 2024, no matter what happens, that you'll be people who wrestle with the Lord. Finally, God initiates much of this encounter with Jacob, but there are two parts that God initiates. God has, he asked for a blessing and he asked for God's name in verse 29. God answers the first one, he gives him the blessing, but he won't give him the second one, right? And instead, on the second one, where he asks God his name, he actually questions, what are your motives? Like, why are you asking me my name? Questions his motives. And there's a sense that, like, and this is kind of odd, right? Because later on, he will reveal his name to Moses, right? Like, you're going to reveal your name to Moses. Like, why won't you reveal, reveal your name to Jacob? And this is what some commentators say. They say this, there's a sense that Jacob doesn't want anything left to mystery. He wants to over, overcome all the distance between him and God. Right? When we wrestle with God, it doesn't mean we will know everything. We'll always know why. We'll have an earthly security that's impenetrable. That's not a, that's not, if we wrestle with God, it doesn't mean that we'll have all those answers. Wrestling with God means we continue to contend when we have questions, when there is mystery, when there is distance, when life through our eyes looks like we've been abandoned. We continue to wrestle. As I said, I don't know what 2024 holds from us. I am, I'm, not a, I'm not a fortune teller. I can't tell you what 2020 holds for each one of us or even our church as a whole. But what I pray that happens in 2024 is that we will be people who truly, no matter what happens, that we will be people who truly contend, wrestle, struggle 
with God this year. So what about you guys? What are you wrestling with this year? What are you wrestling with as we enter the new year? Let's pray together. God, would you help us to Would you help us to be people who will be willing to wrestle with you this year? That no matter what happens, um, as hard as life is sometimes, help us to wrestle with you, Lord. Help us to see that everything that we're going through um, is a wrestling with you. Help us to see, Lord, that on the other side of wrestling, as hard as it is, there is blessing. The day will break, Lord. You won't leave us in the night when we wrestle with you. Lord, increase our faith. That even when everything in our life tells us to just give up, help us to be like Jacob, who will not let go of you until we receive that blessing. So we ask for your spirit to do that work in our hearts in 2024. We pray this in Jesus' name.